Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This program was brought to you by Regional Dairy Specialists with Cornell Cooperative Extension. Today, we will be discussing critical calf care decision making for urgent dairy calf health situations. This is episode two, where we will cover dystocia and difficult calvings. This is the second episode in a seven part series. If this is the first portion of this series you are viewing, we hope that you will tune into our our other sessions as well. Recordings will be posted on our YouTube page and we will put the link in the chat box as well. As a reminder, this content has been approved by the National Milk Producers Federation FARM team as continuing education. Add your participation in this program to your records for your next animal care audit. My name is Casey Havikus. I am one of the Dairy Management Specialists on the North Country Regional Ag Team. And today I'm joined by Betsy Hicks, who is also a Dairy Management Specialist on the South Central New York Dairy and Field Crops Program. Before we jump in, we do want to remind everyone that we are not veterinarians and the materials presented are for educational purposes. We strongly encourage all farms to have a veterinary client patient relationship and that you consult with your veterinarian as the need arises. Thanks, Casey. So today's agenda, we're gonna focus on dystocia, obviously. We're gonna define and discuss dystocia. We're gonna talk about the risk factors and the economic consequences of, of a dystocia birth. We're gonna talk about when to intervene with a difficult birth and focus really on dystocia impacts on the calf. So to start out with, what is dystocia? Simply put, it is an abnormal or difficult time during birth at any stage of labor. When we look a little bit more deeply though, we can see dystocia occurs when there is a failure in one or more of the three main components of calving. And on the right, we have these three components. Expulsive forces, so this is the cow physically being able to push that calf out of the birth canal. Secondly is birth canal adequacy. <clears throat> so does the cow actually have a birth canal suited, uh, pelvic structure and birth canal suited to push that calf out? And then finally is the fetal size and position. Is the calf the right size to be born through the birth canal? And is it positioned correctly in order to come out of the birth canal? We have to have all three of these main components to have a successful calving without a dystocia birth. So why is dystocia important? So in 2007, there was a NOM study of calf loss in North America, and we saw that almost 16% of calves die before weaning in this study. 8% of those deaths are from problems during calving and in the first 48 hours of life. On the left, we see this term called vitality. So vitality is the capacity to live and grow with physical and mental energy and strength. And Casey's gonna cover a little bit about, a little bit more about vitality and how we measure vitality with vigor scoring. But what we know from these two studies at the bottom is that physiology and behavior of the newborn calf is impacted by low vitality. So vitality and vigor scoring are something we're really gonna focus on for the calf in a little bit. So just very quickly, some economic factors for dystocia. In the US annually, it's estimated to cost dairy and beef industries over 400 million. These costs are made up of losing the dam and or the calf both. Uh, dams tend to be culled earlier and produce less milk and also rebreed, rebreed back more slowly. In the calf size, calves are more susceptible to, to disease and the calves are slower to grow. All of these things add up to this, this huge cost that is annually to the dairy and beef industries. Looking at causes for dystocia, we're going to start at the bottom of this pyramid. So the proximal causes are the things that we actually see during a dystocia birth. So this can be the fetal pelvic disproportion, where the calf might be too big for the birth canal or the birth canal is too small for the cow, uh, for the calf to be born, abnormal positioning, uterine inertia, um, and then uterine torsion or vulvar cerv cervical stenosis. So those are things we actually see. Intermediate causes are things when we look a little bit deeper that we can say, okay, these causes are probably because, oh, she had a longer gestation length um, and the calf might be a little bit too big 
or that cow didn't grow enough and her birth canal is a little bit smaller than it should be. Um, and also some nutritional factors or stress that happened to the cow before calving. If we dig even a little bit more deeply, we can see that both of these uh, proximal and intermediate causes are ultimately caused by these things listed here. Fetal gender, if there's a twin pregnancy or a fetal abnormality, um, the sire breed and the dam breed both play into these causes, as well as parity, history, and all of these other things listed and interactions between these causes. All of these things are the ultimate causes for dystocia, but they manifest themselves with the things we see at the bottom in those proximal causes. So when we look at causes and risk factors, um, we can see that fetal size and positioning is the most common type of dystocia and calf birth weight is the most important risk factor for dystocia. Birth weight is influenced by gestation length and gestation length can be influenced by a whole number of things. Parity for sectation cows versus mature cows, gender, bull versus heifer, sire and dam breed we mentioned, maternal nutrition, the dam either being over nourished, so she, um, has a lot of fat in her uh, birth canal or undernourished where she physically just doesn't have the capacity to push that calf out. And then climate during the last trimester has a big, uh, can be a big risk factor as well. When it's cold out, cows may increase their dry matter intake, which then can make that calf weigh more at the end of her gestation. In the end, we need to make sure that we have all three of those main components, the expulsive forces, the birth canal adequacy, and the fetal size and position. We need to have all three of those in order to make sure we have a successful birth. Talking about ranking systems, um, there is no standard scale across the US for ranking dystocia. In general, herds that I work with, they use a one to five scale where one is no assistance, a two is a slight assistance, one person that has to assist and, and do a little pulling, a three is a moderate assistance, generally two people or a much harder pull, a four involves mechanical assistance like using a calf jack, and a five would be a C-section or a surgical removal of that calf. So we can see on the table on the right that we look at calving difficulty, and this is a, like a one to four scale that's used in this table. And uh, severe dystocia, we can see heifers versus cows. Heifers have a higher rate of severe dystocia, almost twice the amount of cows. And then no assistance, cows uh, have about 80% of cows that need no assistance, while heifers are, are less than 70%. So that leads us to chat question number one. So my question to you, the audience, is what are the major causes for dystocia on your farm? So you can use the chat feature at the bottom and you can type in a one if your most common cause for dystocia are undersized heifers calving in. So this would go back to the age and size of the dam. Type in a two if your cows run out of gas during calving. This might be a nutritional cause. And type in a three if your calves are too big to fit into the birth canal. This is the fetal size. This could be due to the sire or the, um, the sire breed that we're using. So moving on to stages of parturition. So there's three main stages when we talk about the calving process. Starting at stage one, uh, some of these things we'll be able to see and some of them we can't. But first off, what we have to have is cervical dilation. The cervix literally has to open up and stretch. This starts to happen four to 24 hours before the birth of the calf. And we can physically see the loosening the, of the pelvic muscles around the tail head. We can also see mucus discharge and the cow will have an increased activity. Like I said, some of these we'll see and some of these we won't. Stage two is what we typically think about calving. So calving is the fetus actually coming out, the calf being born. But before that calf comes out, we're going to see the water bag. We're going to see the amniotic sac. And then we should see two feet and a nose and a normal uh, presentation. What we do want to see is visible progress of that calf being born every 15 to 20 minutes. One to two hours after stage two starts, we should have a calf on the ground. And then finally, stage three, um, again, we think about calving being done when the calf hits the ground, but actually the final stages of parturition involve the afterbirth or the placental expulsion. So contractions have to occur to expel this afterbirth. Um, and this should happen four to 12 hours after the birth of the calf. 
So we can use these stages of parturition to help identify when mom needs help. So one of the things we might see is that the cow isn't straining, but we've seen her be restless for more than four to six hours. This might be a stage one problem. So in the picture on the left, we see the calf in the uterus, and then we see that line, and that's the cervix. The cervix is closed at the beginning of stage one. That cervix needs to open up for that calf to come out. If we don't see her straining, probably that cervix hasn't opened up and we need to assess why that's happening. That's a stage one problem. Secondly, we have listed the cow is straining, but no part of the calf is showing. So this could be a stage one problem where still the cervix isn't open um, or not fully open, or it could be a stage two problem where there's something the matter where the calf isn't lined up correctly. Thirdly, we have the feet or nose of the calf showing, but the calf is not delivered after two hours. This is a stage two problem. And then the same with the abnormal presentation, that's again a stage two problem. So we can use the different stages of parturition to see when and how does mom need help. Your farm should have specific protocols for timeframes to check for problems and when and how to give assistance if needed. Again, we're not veterinarians, but we can use these stages to help identify, but you need to make sure that you have specific protocols for timeframes. You can work with your veterinarian to develop these and modify them as needed. So again, uh, here's some ways to intervene. Step one, we're gonna assess the problem. So is it a normal presentation? The picture on the right shows all the different abnormal presentations we might find. A leg back, a head back, um, coming out tail first, um, being upside down. There's a lot of different ways that calves can be presented abnormally. Second in that list is, is the cervix adequately stretched? And thirdly, uh, making sure that there is no torsion of the uterus. And lastly, we're going to make sure that calf size is pro proportional to the pelvic area. So making sure that everything is met, will that calf actually fit out of the birth canal? So ensuring that all of the things in step one are met, likely you can assist the calf in being born. If they're not or you're not sure, calling a veterinarian is never a bad idea. So the one of the last things that we're going to uh, show on assisting a birth is the proper pulling of a calf. So A number one, we need to make sure we, cleanliness is the top of the list. We're going to have a bucket of clean soapy water and we're going to use gloves. We're not going to go in without scrubbing our hands and gloving up first. Um, and then the picture on the right shows us how to properly attach chains to the calf's leg. We're going to place a loop above and a half hitch below the fetlock joint with a connecting chain on top of the leg. If you're not sure how to do this, there are videos that you can look at on YouTube to help you um, or have your vet show you. It's a pretty simple way to connect chains. Just have to practice a little bit. Next, we're gonna make sure we have adequate lubrication. A lot of times when we have to assist in a birth, the cow's been trying for a while and her natural lubrication has gone away. So we're gonna make sure we have lubrication to help get that calf out. We're gonna make sure we don't use excessive force, especially when we're using mechanical assistance and we're only gonna pull during contractions. All of these things are to make sure we protect the calf and we protect the cow from injury. Lastly is record keeping. In another episode of this um, webinar series, we talk about record keeping in a lot of different situations. With this uh, dystocia birth, we wanna make sure we keep track of records and we use these records to help the calf and the cow afterwards. We're gonna use cow ID, making sure we write down which person assisted, the calving ease score, calf ID, obviously, and then any results on the birth and notes on both the calf and the dam. And we're gonna make sure the people that then work with the dam and then work with the calf, they have these notes. So Casey will cover a little bit and how we're gonna use these records on these calves. So she's gonna move into how dystocia specifically impacts the calf. Yeah, so Betsy just highlighted some really important information about how we can help the mom, but I think it's equally important to remember that when we have a dystocia birth, the calf is going to also be negatively impacted. So we have to consider how dystocia is going to impact that calf. And we can break this down into immediate impacts and then impacts that are going to be more noticeable down the road. 
So when the calf is first born, we might see that she's experiencing some inflammation. So maybe her face is swollen or her tongue is swollen. And we might see that she has asphyxia or hypoxia or both. And those are both fancy terms for a lack of oxygen. So it's important to note here that when the calf is experiencing dystocia, once her umbilicus becomes disconnected from the mom, they are no longer receiving oxygen and they need to breathe in oxygen in order to essentially breathe on their own. So when calves are experiencing dystocia, this is going to increase the duration in which they're able to breathe in air on their own. So asphyxia leads to acidosis and this comes in the form of respiratory or metabolic acidosis. And this occurs when there's inadequate oxygenation of body tissue cells. And then under these circumstances, the cells derive energy from anaerobic glycolysis. And this is gonna result in the production of lactate and leads to this metabolic acidosis. So in animals with asphyxia, the concentration of carbon dioxide produced by the cells increases in the blood. And because its elimination via the placenta or the lungs is impaired, it then can result in respiratory acidosis. So a mild metabolic respiratory acidosis with a pH of slightly more than 7.2 occurs in normal calves immediately after an unassisted birth. And that's considered physiologically normal. But with dystocia calves, this blood pH can be significantly lower. And that's when we start seeing the acidosis. And then lastly, immediately, they're going to have a difficult time thermoregulating. So calves break down brown fat in order to stay warm. And when calves are experiencing dystocia, they're going to be slower to stand, slower to move around, and slower to break down the, fat, the brown fat. And so their inability to, or their ability to thermoregulate will be compromised. And then down the road, you want to watch for things like leg injury. So if something was damaged during the birthing process, they're going to have uh, increased risk of having failure of passive transfer, and that's going to lead to greater risk of developing disease later in life. And they are also going to potentially have poor weight gain. So I just introduced you to this term asphyxia, which again is essentially the absence of oxygen. And this is so detrimental to the calf because it can cause a cascade of events. And this includes decreased blood flow to the liver and kidneys, aspiration, pneumonia, edema, bleeding, and even death. So the point that I want to make here is that these calves can be severely compromised and it's important to evaluate each situation independently and recognize that despite all efforts, sometimes it's not enough. So Betsy and Alicia are going to go over euthanasia decisions in episode six and talk about timely euthanasia. So if this is something that you struggle with on your farm, be sure to tune into episode six where they're going to help you make those decisions. So dystocia also can potentially increase the risk of having poor passive transfer. And this is because calves born with fetal distress have reduced colostrum intake by up to 74% during the first 12 hours of life. And this is partially because they take longer to stand and walk and suckle, and then also partially because acidosis can create what we call a dummy calf syndrome, where the calf doesn't want to suck, her tongue's hanging out of the side of her mouth. It can be very frustrating, and we often say the calves are dumb but in reality, it's a consequence of dystocia. And then the other part of the poor passive transfer comes down to the fact that dystocia can decrease the absorptive capacity of IgGs for those calves. So what we can do as producers to help these calves is to tube feed her if she doesn't willingly drink. So ideally you wanna to try to bottle feed her first, but if she's not going to suckle, tube feed her. She really needs to get that colostrum and she needs to get it into her quickly. You also want to make sure that she's getting a second feeding within a good time frame, and you want to make sure that you're feeding the highest quality colostrum that you have. So it doesn't necessarily have to come from her dam. Maybe you have another cow that just freshened that has better quality colostrum, or you have some frozen. And if you are going to feed frozen colostrum, make sure that you are feeding colostrum that's been warmed properly. So you don't want to throw frozen colostrum into a pail of boiling hot water. It's just going to denature the proteins and essentially make that colostrum pointless. So Betsy briefly mentioned vigor scoring earlier. So I just want to highlight this chart and some research that was done out of the University of Guelph that can be used to help producers assess the severity of dystocia. So this chart called vigor. It's called a vigor chart. It takes into account visual appearance, initiation of movement, general responsiveness, 
oxygenation and rates. And so what you do with this chart is you use each category and assign a score to the cap. So for example, if we look at item number two, the tongue slash head, you would give the cap a zero if she has normal or no swelling, and you would give her a three if her head and tongue are both swollen and the tongue is protruding. So you would go through all of these categories and assign a number to the calf and then add up the score. And depending on what that score is, you can use different management decisions for how you're going to handle that calf. And as I mentioned, Betsy and Alicia are going to go into at what point in time euthanasia should be an option. So that brings us to our second chat question. How frequently do you track vigor? So in the chat box, put a one if you do it every time a calf is born. Put a two only when you suspect the calf was born to dystocia and put a three if you never do it regardless of how the birth was. So the rest of the presentation, we're going to talk about how you can help dystocia calves. And this is going to be done through five steps. The, so the first thing you wanna do is help get her breathing. So you wanna make sure her airways are cleared and stimulate respiration if she is not already breathing on her own. So even if calves aren't born to dystocia, they're born with high levels of carbon dioxide and low levels of oxygen. And that's going to be more pronounced for the dystocia calf, which makes it e even more important that she starts breathing. So some ways that you can help her breathe is to sit the calf upright in a position called sternal recumbency, which you can see in the photo here. You can also stick a piece of straw or hay up the calf's nose to gently tickle her. Or you could pour cold water over her head, which is going to stimulate a gas reflex and help her breathe. You can also rub the calf somewhat vigorously, but the one thing that you should never do is hang her upside down or swing her to try to get fluid out of her lungs. That is going to do more damage than it's going to do good, so please never do that. The second thing that you want to do is maintain her body temperature. So as I said, newborn calves raise their body temperature by breaking down fat and by physical activity. But dystocia calves are going to be compromised in their ability to do so. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can from a management perspective to help keep them warm. So some strategies include drying them off. So like I just mentioned, you can rub them vigorously with a towel. Not only is that going to help get them breathing, but it's also going to help maintain her body temperature. You can use heaters or hot boxes, such as the photo that's shown here. Make sure that the bedding is dry and warm, and then feed colostrum. So warm colostrum is going to help maintain her body temperature. So that leads us to our third point, which is to expand blood volume. And you can do this by making sure that you get the colostrum into her. So as I previously mentioned, you wanna give her the highest quality colostrum that you have and make sure it's warm properly. And if she won't drink, make sure you're tube feeding her. As I mentioned, this will not reduce her success of passive transfer at this point. Feeding colostrum is gonna help circulate the blood and help correct acidosis. And it's also going to help maintain or even raise the calf's body temperature. And that leads us to our last chat question. If a calf does not drink, do you tube feed her? So in the chat box, put a one if you're always tube feeding her if she doesn't drink. By bottle, put a two if you only do it sometimes and put a three if you're never tube feeding her regardless of the situation. So the fourth management tip is to consider giving her a non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug. And an example of this is bandamine. So there's been some research that's shown that this can help with pain and inflammation, it can potentially improve vigor, it can improve her suckle reflex, and it can help improve her weight gain through pre-weaning. It's very important that you work with a vet if you want to implement this strategy. Non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, in this particular example, using them for dystocia calves is considered extra label use, so you need to work with your vet to discuss this strategy if it's something that you want to do. And then lastly, monitor her closely. So there's a pink clothespin concept where you put a pink clothespin or as shown in this picture, a pink collar or whatever color for that matter. It's just a tool that you can use as a calf manager to make sure that all of the employees and all of the people that are working with calves are aware that that calf was born to dystocia and that she's going to be at greater risk of failure of passive transfer and consequently at greater risk of experiencing disease later in life. So at any sign of disease, you may want to intervene sooner than you would with a healthy calf, especially because she's going to be at greater risk. So 
So to wrap it up, we're going to summarize some of the key considerations from today's webinar. So as Betsy mentioned, dystocia is defined as an abnormal or difficult birth and can have severe effects on both the mom and the baby. We want to make sure that we understand the risk factors and recognizing interrupted signs of calving can make a hard calving easier. Try your best to implement bigger scoring on your farm. This is a tool that can help you quickly identify vulnerable calves. And lastly, taking those key steps, as I just mentioned, those five management strategies after a dystocia birth will help improve vitality and survivability of these dystocia calves. So thank you very much for tuning into this week's webinar. Please feel free to submit your questions to the Q&A Zoom feature. And please join us for our next session on record keeping and economics of disease, which will be, will be next Tuesday, January 19th at the same time with the same Zoom link. My contact information as well as Betsy's con contact information is here on the screen. If you have any questions, please reach out to us also. He has to use just to warm up a liquid. Um, I have seen people putting, like if their barn is far away from their hot water source, um, putting their hot water into a cooler or a thermos, um, and that helps keep it warm from their hot water source to their barn. There's just, just lots of ways we can try to work around this, but we've got to get that colostrum warm, and if we can't, we've got to use colostrum replacer at the right temperature as well. Okay. Um, our calves are sent day one to a heifer raiser. Would you suggest having us keep dystocia calves for a longer period of time to see them through? That's a great question. Um, and I was curious if we were going to have any producers on that would uh, not raise their calves. So um, yeah, that, that makes sense to me to keep them there or uh, communicate that with your heifer raiser to say, if we mark our dystocia calves in a certain way, are you able to care for them separately? And, you know, the conversation might go from there. But if you, if they are not up to that task, then certainly I think keeping them at your farm where you can monitor them more, more quickly, uh, more frequently is, is a better option for that calf for sure. I might also add that it'd be, um, a good idea to keep track of those calves and see if you have a record of how those calves do at the heifer raiser and to um, maybe look back and see do you have to do a little bit more or can there be a little bit more done uh, to help those calves through if you do see a negative trend following those calves throughout the, the system. Yeah, great point. Um, in the webinar, you said passive transfer can be decreased up to 74% as a result of dystocia. But in the case that the calf is tubed in the first four hours, what is it more expected to be? Yeah, that's a good question. So if I remember correctly, that um, research said that colostrum intake specifically could be decreased by up to 74%. And um, I believe that's just voluntary colostrum intake. And if you're tube feeding the calf, then the risks are going to be lower, obviously, because they're at least getting it. Um, I don't have an exact number to give you for that, but we, we would have to assume that it wouldn't be as high as 74% the risk of failure of passive transfer if you're for sure tubing that calf. Then it's just going to be an issue of dystocia calves may have a decreased ability to absorb those IgGs, but at the very least, they're getting it versus calves that are only offered by bottle and if they decide not to drink and that's their sole source of getting the colostrum, then those risks are going to be higher. Um, how often do you recommend blood serum total protein being checked on calves to check uh, passive transfer? Yeah, so um, I mean, a lot of firms do every calf if that's not something that you're doing on your farm and you're getting your vet to come out and do it, um, I would say just doing a subset of your calves, figuring out with your herd veterinarian what a good subsample from your herd population would be. Um, for smaller farms, that might be a little bit more. For bigger farms, you might be able to get away with doing calves you know, once a week, once a month, once a season, depending on if you're having problems or not. I think that's gonna be very subjective to the farm. And I think that's something that you're gonna to have to work out with your herd veterinarian. And if any of you guys want to add anything to that. 
Um, what temperature is too high to thaw frozen colostrum? Or what temperature will denature the proteins? So above 140 will definitely denature proteins, uh, but good rule of thumb, 120 degrees Fahrenheit is about as hot as you can stand as a human. Some people can withstand maybe five degrees more, but a good rule of thumb is if it's too hot for your hand to go in, it's too hot to thaw colostrum. So I always like these, you know, everybody should have a thermometer on farm and check while they're running their hot water bath, but odds are you don't have one. <laughs> so if it is too hot for your hand, it is too hot to thaw colostrum. I like that 120, maybe 125, but no warmer. Anybody else toss in their thoughts? <laughs> Is there anything we can do to help calves expel fluids they may have gotten into their lungs during birth? In case you touched on this a little bit. Um, definitely don't hang them upside down or swing them. Um, in terms of doing anything to get it out, I think just getting them to start breathing normally and stimulating respiration is going to help that. Um, Betsy, Margaret, Alicia. Yeah, the other thing I'll toss in there is sternal recumbency. So we want her up on her sternum. Some people call it the frog position. Um, literally, that's the best way, especially if her, both of her back legs are in front of her. Um, she is very stable that way and uh, it's the best way for her lungs to inflate. So putting her in that position, she's not really capable to get out of it on her own unless she's really struggling. If she's really struggling, she's probably breathing better. Um, so putting her in that position, um, we can find a picture of that really quick to toss a link in the chat if we have time. Um, but look up sternal recumbency um, and that's the position you should put your calf in to help them breathe and expel that liquid out of their lungs. It's directly right after um, birth and they're not breathing, you can stick a little piece of straw up their nose and wiggle it around a little bit to help them, you know, they'll, they'll kind of sneeze and blow some of that fluid out. Um, and I've, I've heard, I don't know, you might want to check with your vet, but I've heard some people dumping cold water over their heads to make them uh, take a breath quickly and that'll help them breathe and help them then expel that extra fluid that's in their lungs. I've never done that personally, but I've, I've heard that it, that it works. So I just want to uh, quickly add to, to the question about um, checking passive transfer levels. I didn't mention this, but it's important that if you're doing it yourselves on your farm to make sure that the calves are at least 24 hours old. And um, I've heard between seven and 10 days of age being the maximum. I do seven days when I'm doing my research projects, but Again, work with your veterinarian to see if uh, 10 days works for you. And then the other thing is if you're doing it yourselves to try to target within two hours of them being fed so that they're hydrated. If you're taking blood samples from a dehydrated calf, the values may be inflated and not actually representative of true passive transfer. Yep, and there'll be more on that in our upcoming episodes. Um, what's your opinion on IVing IVing oxygen to those calves. I'm not sure if IVing is the correct term here, but Probably. we're talking <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're talking about oxygen um, to those calves that are having a hard time breathing. Anybody want to jump in? <laughs> no, I'll take a stab. Um, I don't think it's ever a bad idea. I don't know many farms that actually do have oxygen that they give to their calves. Um, but certainly, I mean, if, if they are dystocia calves, they're having a tough time breathing, giving them a source of oxygen is definitely going to help them get the proper uh, oxygenation in their blood, right? Things that Casey touched on in her portion. Um, anything that'll help her get through this lump of when her blood is not the way it should be, is going to be helpful. For length of time and how much to give, definitely check with your veterinarian. They're gonna give you a lot better recommendation than what I just said. So. And if you can't get a, a great answer, we do have a veterinarian uh, with Pro Dairy, Dr. Rob Lynch, that we can definitely either get your, uh, give you his email, or you can look it up, or um, you can send any one of us an email and we can help you uh, follow up on that question further. 
Um, I have heard that adding a tablespoon of colostrum will help poor doers. Is that true? I'm not sure what a tablespoon of colostrum to what. So Deb Brown, can you expand on your question a little bit? And then uh, what are your recommendations on getting non-suckling calves going? Yeah, that non-suckling calf, that is like one of the most frustrating thing as a calf raiser, right? Um, some people call it, Casey alluded to it, that dummy calf. Um, those calves like just had a really hard time being born and sometimes they're the really big calves and they just, they're dumb, but really they have things that just didn't happen the right way when they were born. Um, what we didn't refer to was the Madigan squeeze method. Um, that has helped. It's more in the beef world that people use this and in horses. Um, but good YouTube videos you can look up, look up on that method. Um, it just helps reset the calf's brain. Um, but that's like, a, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever, ever actually studied that. Um, but methods to getting them to suckle, uh, some people, I don't know where I want to go with this other than Madigan squeeze. Casey, you want to jump in? <laughs> Save me. <laughs> yeah, I... I think so. I think it's really important for those calves that don't suckle. I know tube feeding is not enjoyable for the calf, for the person doing it. Um, I think it's really important that those calves get the colostrum first and foremost. And then once they start, um, like I mentioned in that one slide, one of the, once you give the calf colostrum, it's going to expand her blood volume. It's going to help her warm up. I think it's really just going to have a cascade of events that eventually is going to help that calf to come back to normal and hopefully she's going to start suckling then. I agree with Betsy, there's nothing more frustrating than a calf that doesn't want to drink. Um, yeah, I guess I don't have any real good advice for how to get that calf to start suckling, but I will say that it's really important that she gets that colostrum so at least that cascade of events starts to happen. Um, I know, I don't know how much research is behind it, but I know that Sheila McGurk out of Wisconsin, out of the Veterinary College in Wisconsin, um, at one point had recommended um, a, like a one hour shot caffeine right down the hatch to help with uh, slow or dopey calves, kind of wakes them up a little bit. So that's like those, um, is that what they're called? The one hour shot? Hour. It's like an energy shot. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure the research behind that or um, other veterinary opinions on that, but um, if you look or Google Sheila McGurk out of uh, UW-Madison, uh, you might find some information there too. Yeah, and going along, I mean, those one-hour energies, they're like vitamin B, so you can give vitamin B complex, um, you can do shots of BOCI or MUSI, um, those things, you know, talk with your vet around them too. Sometimes the trace mineral status and vitamin B status can be a little bit compromised in calves, so those things can be things added to your protocols at birth to help those non-sucklers. Okay, um, a little bit more information on the question we had earlier. I've heard that adding a tablespoon of colostrum to a bottle of milk will help poor doers. Is that true? So that might be getting into the transition milk concept. So um, yes, so first and foremost, you want to be giving that calf her first bottle of her first feeding of colostrum and then there's research that suggests that even that second feeding of colostrum within 12 hours your IUG absorption is still really high so you want to if you can try to be feeding at least two feedings of colostrum and then moving forward feeding transition milk so even um, I guess even more than a tablespoon of colostrum to your milk so if you're just taking that third milking or if you're doing you know a 50 50 mix and um, Margaret and I are going to get into this a little bit more in episode five, but if you're able to feed half milk, half colostrum, those calves really benefit. So I can't say for sure that one tablespoon is going to have a significant impact on the benefits that we see when we feed transition milk, but um, having, having the properties of colostrum and transition milk in those feedings following the first 12 hours are really beneficial. Okay, um, is it ever okay to skip a feeding in a calf that's a few days old that just doesn't want to drink or should they be tube fed until they drink on their own? Uh, my personal opinion 
would be if you are, if this happens right after feeding colostrum, especially if you're feeding uh, that full gallon amount of colostrum, it's okay if that calf is not as hungry for that next meal, or if you've tube fed a very large meal, it's okay to skip one. Um, if the calf continues not to drink, I mean, a, health, a healthy calf is gonna be hungry um, 24 hours later, but maybe 12 hours later, it'd be okay to, to skip that meal. I would just add, you know, let's use the things we talked about today, the vigor scoring, um, make sure that calf is actually, you know, responding to life the way it should. And let's use the calf health scoring chart. Is there a reason why it's not hungry or is it just really full and it's doing fine? So let's use the tools we have and assess, take a temperature on it, assess the respiratory, you know, assess what's going on and then make your decision. Is calf just full? That's great. We can skip a feeding. But if it's showing signs that it's got something happening, um, let's, let's either tube feed it or give it some electrolytes, figure out what's going on. We have our next episode of this webinar series coming out next week, same time, same link. And I have to look up actually what, what's the topic for that one. I don't have it right in front of me. It's record keeping. Oh, that's going to be, it's going to be me and Alicia talking about record keeping for your calves. So um, stay tuned for that. And we hope that you'll join us next week.